chapter 3, and it's the last chapter in the book of Titus. It's probably going to be the longest sermon. It's not that long of a chapter, but we'll go through every verse here. And in verse number 1, the Bible reads, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Now, I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. And what the Bible said in Titus 3 verse 1 is that we are to obey magistrates, to be subject to principalities and powers. And the Bible actually teaches that we should obey the authorities that we have out there. Okay? The Bible teaches we should obey the authority of the government. Okay? Now there is an exception to this, and I'm going to show you that exception. But the general rule is that we should obey what the government says. Okay? Now I want you to notice what it says in Daniel chapter 6 verse 5. It says in Daniel 6, verse 5, this is an exception to that. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. This is the testimony that we all should have. That if people do not like us at work, or people that we know don't like us, the only way they can accuse us is because we're too zealous for Christianity. Right. The only way they can accuse us is because of something that we believe, or something such as that. But not because of our attitudes, or, or, or what we do. But just because of what we believe. In verse number 6, Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king, and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. Now these people, they hate Daniel. Isn't it amazing how in the Old Testament, if you live for God, then the people hate you? Yeah. Same thing today. When you live for God, when you're a godly person, by and large the world will reject you, the world will hate you. And they want to get Daniel killed in this story. And it says in verse 7, all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors, and the princes, the counselors, and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, you should always be suspicious when someone is really kind of buttering you up and flattering you because they're basically just making the king out to be like a god. Right. You're saying nobody can ask anything of any god. They can only ask of you, king, for 30 days. And, of course, you know, Darius is like most people. Man, that sounds good. You know, everyone's going to ask me. You know, it sounds like a good rule. But, you know, Darius was not a bad guy. He actually liked Daniel. Now, we're not going to read all of Daniel chapter 6. You know the end of the story. But as if you remember in the story, Daniel does not stop praying. He keeps doing what he's always been doing, even though it is illegal by the law. Right. Okay? So basically, there's a situation where God's law and the government are in conflict with one another. And so basically, it says you're not allowed to pray for 30 days. And so if there's a law that comes across our country that you can't pray for 30 days, we just disregard that. Right. It doesn't matter what the government says. If they say, well, you can't assemble for church, you can't have church service, no soul winning for the month of September, or, you know, no, no reading the Bible. You know, if you have a Bible, you know, it gets taken from you. You know, in communist countries, it was illegal to have a Bible. Right. And they would put you in jail or take it from you or kill you if you owned a Bible. Well, that would be a law that you disobey because it goes in conflict with what the Bible says. Okay? So there is an exception to the general rule. Now, turn back to Titus 3. Titus 3. But honestly, that's a rare exception because it's not often. I mean, I don't know that it's ever happened in the Philippines where hey, it's illegal to read the Bible. It's illegal to pray. It's illegal to go soul winning. I mean, honestly, we have pretty free reign in this country to do that. Yeah. And there's not really any laws that are coming in conflict with our religious beliefs. Okay. Now, I will say this, that I don't agree with everything the government does. And, you know, sometimes the government will tax you for various things. And in the Bible... Even though they shouldn't be taxed, they still just pay the taxes. Because they're in the country, they're in, underneath the government, and they just obey that. That was what Jesus showed us. And so even though we don't agree with how the money's being spent, we just pay our taxes. We do things such as that. So we basically just obey the government if they do not infringe upon our rights. Now in Daniel 6, we have a rare exception where you're not allowed to pray. But realize this, that when the government has some sort of rule like it's illegal to speed over 35 miles per hour... That doesn't infringe upon your rights. Yeah. That doesn't mean that you can't pray or can't read the Bible. And look, you know what? I think we ought to obey that. You say, why? Because the government, or the Bible says here that you're supposed to obey magistrates, be subject to principalities and powers. And if that's the law that the government put in action and it does not infringe upon our rights, we are to obey that. 
Now, does that mean that I agree with all of the rules that government has? Of course not. Okay, I mean, they, they, they have a lot of stupid rules where you're not allowed to do this, you're not allowed to do that. But, you know, according to the Bible, we should just obey what they say, yeah. okay? Because it does not infringe upon our rights. It's really a rare exception when they're going to have some sort of law that infringes upon our rights. For example, jaywalking is illegal. You have to wait until it goes from red to green to walk across. You know, we should just obey that. Yeah, that's kind of what the Bible is teaching here. Even if it's a rule that doesn't necessarily make sense, it's just open to walk, you should just obey because that is the law that's been put in our country. Now, obviously, depending on what the law is, you can get in real trouble if you disobey it. Now, a lot of people, they want to fight against the government and go against everything they say. But, you know, honestly, the Bible talks about reprobates despising authority. And God has given us certain authorities in our lives. You grow up and you have your parents, and even if they give you rules that you don't like, you just obey it because they are the authority. Your boss at work might give you a bunch of dumb rules. Guess what? You just obey what he says, even if it doesn't make sense. The government certainly has a lot of stupid rules. But you know what? We should just obey what they say. That's what it teaches in Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Now, I'm not going to say that I've always been perfect at this. You know, when I used to drive in the U.S., there would definitely be times I'd drive over the speed limit. But honestly, I think we should just obey what their laws. is. If you choose not to obey, you can definitely get a speeding ticket. And, and honestly, when we look at the context of this, when you're disobeying all the rules that are out there, you know, it can cause you to have a bad testimony. Yeah. If you say, I've had like 20 speeding tickets, you know, honestly, the average person out there is going to look like, wow, you know, you're just kind of a rebellious person, which, you know, you kind of are. And so honestly, when it comes to rules, even if we don't agree with what the government says, we're just to obey it as long as they don't infringe upon our rights to serve as Christians. Okay? Now, obviously, if they would infringe upon your rights of being a father, there's another exception. For example, you know, in America, you can get the CPS call on your child protection services. So let's say, for example, you have your baby in the hospital, and then all of a sudden they don't think you're doing a good job taking care of your kids. Somebody can call CPS, and somebody comes into your home and just takes your child from you. And so that's infringing upon your rights of being a husband and a father and things such as that. You know, when, when our son was born, you know, our son was in the hospital, and, you know, he was born a month early. And so being born a month early, you know, he weighed less, and they have all these extra tests they want them to do. You know, he got tested for jaundice like 5,000 times. And then they said, well, you know, they just went through all these loopholes and things. And they're really trying to make us go to a pediatrician. And we didn't have a pediatrician in the U.S. because, you know, I just didn't really see a purpose to it. But I was trying to just be nice enough where basically they wouldn't try to take our child from us. Because, honestly, they can just call and have you reported because they say you're doing a bad job as a father. You're doing a bad job as a mother. What's amazing is they'll take your child from you and they'll give them to some sodomite to raise. They'll take your child from you and they'll raise them and then who knows what's going to happen. Look, when, when my sister was, you know, probably 19 years old, she was married, they had their first child, and when they had their first child, my sister didn't really go out of the home too much, they only had one vehicle, and so the neighbor actually called CPS on them because they said, you know, we, we never see her leaving, you know, the, the trailer, and then my brother-in-law had a beard. So I said, you know, man, he's got a beard, she's never leaving the trailer, it's like, oh, no, we're worried about this, and CPS actually knocked on their door. Now, my brother-in-law knew his rights, though, and he said, no, you're not allowed in our home because you can refuse that unless they, they have some sort of warrant. They have a reason to do that. That is infringing upon your rights of being a parent. And if you've been given a child, that is your child to raise. So I'm not saying we should just obey the government mindlessly if they're infringing upon your rights of something major such as that. When it comes to just general stupid stuff that they have or just general laws, we should just obey those laws. And if we don't, you know, you can get into trouble, you can hurt your testimony, it can cause you fines and things such as that. So in verse number two, the Bible reads, To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Now, we realize that in Titus chapter one, when we're going through it, it talks about rebuking false prophets. So we need to understand the full context. It's, it's not that you can never preach against, you know, some sort of Calvinist reprobate or something such as that. But, you know, honestly, in the context here, we're seeing that these are people that we want to get saved. We'll see that in the next couple of verses. It says, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. 
One thing you're going to see in the Bible is that gentleness and meekness often go together. Okay? Now, these are both fruits of the Spirit. There are nine fruits of the Spirit, and gentleness is one of those, and meekness is another. Now, people often ask, what is the difference between meekness and humbleness? Because they seem to be very similar to one another. Whenever you look up humble in the Bible, it will say something like, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humbleness is something you do to yourself, whereas meekness is how you interact with somebody else. So basically, if you humble yourself, it's going to help cause you to be meek or humble with someone else. Okay? So it's, it's basically kind of the same thing, except humbleness is to the individual, and then meekness is how you relate to other people. But basically being you know, humble towards other people when you're around them. One example is for if somebody at church or, or, or somebody visiting church tells you something that's kind of foolish, but you're kind of new to church, you don't have to just rebuke them and say, you're an idiot. That's not what the Bible teaches. You know, you can say something nice, like, oh, that's an interesting thought, I'll check it out. Realizing if they're new to church, they might not know everything. And so basically being meek to someone else, and also gentle, as is mentioned here, is basically you act very kind to other people. And you don't expect people to have everything perfectly figured out, okay? Look, when people come into church, especially if it's new to them, they're going to have a lot of problems and a lot of things that are off on. They're going to say a lot of things that just don't make sense sometimes. You know, sometimes people that are safe will say things like, you know, hey, I gave my life to God when I was 19 years old. Now, look, that's not a biblical term, and it's a bad teaching because that would be the work salvation because God gave his life for us. We don't give our life to God. And then some of those same people, well, everything else they say is correct. So it's kind of like they just don't understand. Well, they'll say something kind of weird. Realize people are new, you know, that is okay, all right? Obviously, the preaching of the word will help change their mind and help them understand these things. Now, let me give you an example of something that would not be having a good testimony, not being gentle, not being meek. Something that I did when I was probably 20 years old. I had been street preaching one time in my life. Okay? Now, my street preaching was kind of cool because it was in front of the, the, the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City. Like their <laughs> main office, their main headquarters. And I was with two other guys who were Baptists who probably weren't even saved, to be honest. And we're basically just screaming with the Mormons, going back and forth. And I mean, everything we said was true. We were just like hammering them and saying all these things. But quite honestly, that doesn't really accomplish anything. Right. And you get nobody saying. And somebody actually came up to us like an hour and a half later. And I don't, I don't know who this guy was or if he was even saved. If I remember correctly, he was kind of like a Ray Comfort man. I think he was Ray Comfort man. I'm not really sure. But he basically said, hey, you know, what I found is it's actually, you know, easier to just stop people from going by the street. A lot of them will talk to you rather than, it's like, I love your passion, but, you know, I think this might be a better way. And that's what we did. We just started talking to people as they walked by. And I was like, wow, this is a lot better than just screaming. Because nobody's listening to you. It's just a waste of time. And you just get yourself banned from being able to enter the, the, the big temple in Salt Lake City. Which I probably still am banned. I don't know. It's take a picture and a video if you ever do something like that. But that's what I did when I was 20. Now, look, I don't think that's what we should do, though. You look like a fool, and honestly, it causes people within Christianity is a joke. Street preachers turn people away from the gospel. Right. Street preachers make it hard for us to preach the gospel because you look like a jerk, because you're honestly being a bit of a jerk. And so this honestly applies not just with street preaching, but also just how we interact with social media and things such as this. And when it comes to being behind the pulpit, pastors need to be bold. They need to preach the truth, right. but at the same time, when you step outside the pulpit, you're not a jerk to everyone, yeah. and you don't just rip your heads off. No one in this room has ever seen me be a jerk outside the pulpit and yell at people outside the pulpit. You say, why? Because the platform God has given us is behind the pulpit, and when you're not behind the pulpit, it's not your place to do that. And I don't go above my knees, even though I'm the one who's preaching the sermons here, because that's something to be done behind the pulpit. But look, I'll, I will preach against women wearing pants behind the pulpit, but what I won't do is preach against some guests, you know, one-on-one -on -one talking to them, saying, hey, you're not dressed right. Look, pretty much everyone who visits this church for the first time that is not from our movement is going to be wearing pants, whether it's a guy or a girl. Now, if it's a guy that's not wearing pants, then, you know, they're, they're going to be hitting the road. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is this, that, you know, honestly, we just need to give people more of a chance. We need to give them time. And if we turn them off to Christianity, we're not going to get them saved. Verse number three. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, 
serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, but after that the kindness and love of God toward our God, our Savior toward man appeared. Realize before you were saved, you were actually foolish. Before you were saved, you were guilty of a lot of these things. And quite honestly, if Christians were a bit of jerks and obnoxious, you might have been turned off to Christianity. You might not have gotten saved. Look, you know, I don't hold back when I preach the sermons behind the pulpit, but quite honestly, a new person, the first thing they need, they need to hear is the gospel. Because yeah. a lot of the things that they're hearing behind the pulpit, they're going to think it's crazy. Right. It's not going to make any sense to them. Why? Because they are foolish. That's one reason why we need to have a good attitude is because of the fact that unsaved people are foolish before they're saved. Yeah. Quite honestly, the things they believe are ridiculous. But we were the same way. Look, before I was saved, you know, I remember when I was a freshman in college, I was part of Campus Crusade, which is a, a Christian organization. It's a non-denominational non organization. And they did like a, a, a campus program where basically they bought everybody pizza on the floor. And they just went around and said, hey, they had everybody gathering together and would ask, hey, what do you think it takes to get to heaven? Now, look, I was a member of Campus Crusade. You know, I'd been there for like a month. You know, I was a new freshman. And this is what I said. I said, as long as you think that what you're doing is right, then you will get to heaven. Even if you're a really bad person like Saddam Hussein. I used Saddam Hussein as an example. The famous dictator from Iraq that supposedly said he thought it was King Nebuchadnezzar reincarnate. That's what I said got you to heaven. And then, of course, I got saved a few months later. And I'm like, man, what a bobo statement. That as long as you think you're doing I mean, Jeffrey Dahmer might have thought he was doing right by killing people. But realize before we're saved, it doesn't really matter whether you're intelligent or not intelligent. We all believe pretty foolish things. Every false religion is pretty foolish when you think about it. To honestly think you can work your way to heaven, that's ridiculous. And some of the cults in the Philippines, I mean, they're a joke. They're so ridiculous. But before we're saved, we believe a lot of pretty foolish and stupid things. Interestingly enough, even though the person who was the head of Campus Crusade at West Virginia University heard me say that, he didn't give me the gospel. He didn't tell me how to get to heaven. It's like, well, probably because he did not know himself, I would presume. But it's like you hear somebody in your organization who is going there and thinks they're a Christian say, hey, as long as you think you're, you're doing what's right, you'll go to heaven. He never told me how to get to heaven. I had a friend who gave me the gospel a few months later unrelated to campus crusade. But, but what a great organization that's just bringing in all these people at college. They don't even tell them how to get to heaven. What a joke it is, because they don't even have the right gospel themselves. Verse 4, it talks about God, our Savior. Throughout the Bible, you'll see that God is our Savior, but you also know that Jesus Christ is our Savior. And it's not a contradiction, because we know that Jesus Christ is God. It's plain as day in the Bible. Now, look at verse number 5. And the Bible reads, Not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, this is not one of the common verses I use for soul winning, but honestly, it's a great verse that you could use for soul winning. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. So it's not our works that get us saved. But, you know, honestly, this is a verse that people that believe in baptismal regeneration, that think you have to be baptized to go to heaven, they actually use verse 5 to try to prove their point. And their argument is, well, it says the washing of regeneration. So you get regenerated when you get washed in the water when you get baptized. Baptized, okay? Now turn to John 3. John 3. Unfortunately, a lot of people, especially that are unsaved, they don't understand what symbolism is in the Bible when it says washing of regeneration. But just because it uses the term water or washing, that doesn't mean it's referring to baptism. Look at the Bible, people were drinking the water. They weren't getting baptized. In John 4, the woman is not getting baptized in the well, okay? Because there's water, that doesn't mean that they're getting baptized. Now, John 3 is another famous example where they try to take this out of context and say you have to get baptized. But it says in John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the Bible says we must be born again. We're physically born one time, and we must be spiritually born in order to go to heaven. Verse 4, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? This is a very intelligent and educated man. 
but he has no idea about the, the being spiritually born again. He's thinking of physically being born. And so understanding that he's talking about being inside your mother's womb and being born again, Jesus answers him to explain what he's thinking about. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so Nicodemus is thinking about a physical birth, and Jesus is basically saying, you have to be born physically, which is born of the water, and then you have to be born spiritually in order to go to heaven. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so verse 6 makes it very clear because it says that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's referring to your physical birth. So basically you're born of water because obviously, you know, the water breaks when mom's about to have the child. And so that's why it uses that terminology. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. There's a physical birth and there's a spiritual birth. Now, obviously, a baby would go to heaven if they die. But Jesus is talking to a full grown man. Who's thinking about being born again. He's like, no, you were born physically. Now you need to be born spiritually in order to go to heaven. Now turn back to Titus 3. And so in verse number 5, it says the washing of regeneration. Now, regeneration is the moment that you get saved. And it's talks about washing because what it's, it's talking here is not really a symbolism of baptism, but of basically like taking a shower. Because what happens when you take a shower? You get cleansed. You get off all of the dirt. Okay? You become clean. Okay? When you get saved, you become clean. That does not mean you're perfect, but your soul is perfect. You are spiritually perfect forever. You're regenerated. So when it says washing, this has nothing to do with baptism. It doesn't mention baptism at all. Right. The symbolism is basically like taking a shower. Look, you know, you've been working hard, you're sweaty, you're dirty, and what do you do? You take a shower, you scrub off, and guess what? You are cleansed, you are clean. And so salvation is similar to that, because when you get saved, spiritually you're cleansed forever. You will never be held accountable for any of your sins, past, present, or future. Now, you will pay for your sins here on earth if you're a bad person, but you will not go to hell to pay for those sins because spiritually you are clean, you are regenerated, you are a child of God. Verse number six, the Bible reads, Which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, this is a famous passage that Calvinists like to use in verses five through seven. Because regeneration is a word that they really like to use and abuse and misuse. Because basically what Calvinists believe is that regeneration occurs you know, before you even believe. And then you believe and then you get saved later on. That's how I've heard some Calvinists explain it. Because they try to get around these verses that sound like you know, if you believe, that's when you get saved. They say, well, you, know, you get regenerated before you believe. That's what I've heard a lot of Calvinists say. Martin Luther, I'm sure this is what he taught, is that in the moment of baptism, that's when you get regenerated. And what that means is later on in life, you will place your faith in Jesus Christ. That's what a lot of Calvinists believe. They don't believe you have to get baptized to be saved, but every single person who gets saved got baptized, except the people on the cross. But everybody else, if you're really saved, that means you would have gotten baptized. It's a really weird belief when you believe in infant baptism. Because you're basically saying the parents are making the decision of your salvation, which I guess is guided by the hand of God. But what they would say is basically that you get regenerated at the moment that you're baptized, but you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Now, this is where you get the term baptismal regeneration. And some people believe that occurs you know, as you become an adult. You believe, and then you get baptized, and that's when you're regenerated. But a lot of Calvinists through the years have believed historically that when you get baptized as a baby— that is when you're regenerated, and that means later on in life you will place your faith in Jesus Christ because you were regenerated as a baby. That is so bizarre. That is so ridiculous. You know, when you look at all the verses, being saved and receiving everlasting life, these are synonymous with one another. And trying to make a distinction between those things is ridiculous. It's different terms for the same thing. The moment you get saved is the moment you get born again, is the moment you get regenerated, is the moment you receive everlasting life. 
And they try to weasel out of this by just saying there's all these steps of salvation, basically. But there's regeneration, and then later on, I believe everlasting life's the next thing. And then you receive salvation later on or something like that. You know, it's, it's so bizarre. Now, here it says in verse 7 that being justified by his grace. Now, Calvinists will tell you that they believe salvation is by grace alone. And some would argue that are really ardent Calvinists that were the ones who had works to salvation. What we argue is that they're adding works to salvation. Now, which one of us really believes salvation is by grace through faith? Now, I would say they don't really believe salvation is by grace through faith because they believe regeneration occurs before faith. So that doesn't even make sense. But here's why they don't really believe salvation is by grace. One thing is, they believe at the moment of regeneration, the vast majority of Calvinists, that the moment you get regenerated, you basically yield your entire life to God. Okay? Now, sometimes they won't use the word repent. Lordship salvation is far worse than repentance of sins. Because it's not just that you feel a little bit bad for your sins and say, man, I'm not going to drink anymore. It's that you completely yield your entire life to God, and you would never become a carnal Christian ever. You would never do anything too terrible. A lot of Calvinists believe that David did not get saved until after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. <laughs> now, they are very embarrassed to admit that, but when you read their writings, a lot of the famous Calvinists, that is what they believe. They believe that salvation for David occurred after he committed adultery with Bathsheba. I have never personally heard Ray Comfort say he's a Calvinist, but I do know that's what he believes that David was not saved before the adultery with Bathsheba, according to his comfortable version of the Bible that he made, where he basically changes the King James to a more comfortable style. He does have his own Bible where he changed the words from believeth to believes and all this stuff, and I'm sure he mixed in some heresy there left and right as well. But that's what a lot of Calvinists believe. But at the moment of regeneration, they believe you basically yield your entire life to God. Now, I believe that some people can be a little bit confused on repentance. For example, a lot of people don't know what the word repent means. But when you're saying that you yield your entire life to God, that is far worse than just being a little bit confused on repentance. Right. That is a far stronger version of work salvation. Another thing they say is this, that if you're really saved, you will bear fruit. Basically, also, that you could never be a carnal Christian ever. R.C. Sproul was very famous for that. Paul Washer is very famous. There is no such thing as a carnal Christian. They say that. I mean, R.C. Sproul, before he died and went to hell, said that the, the, the doctrine of believe only for salvation was one of the most ghastly and disgusting beliefs ever taught within Christianity. He said the idea of a carnal Christian is a joke. It's kind of funny because his Calvinist son, not too long later, ends up being an adulterer. Yet Calvinists say he was saved because of what, he, what his doctrine was of Calvinism. They make an exception for him, even though he committed adultery on his wife. And he became a drunk and got caught with drunk driving quite a bit, his son R.C. Sproul Jr. But, you know, they say there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Well, we're not saying that you can never sin, that you can never become a carnal Christian. But Paul stated that he was a carnal Christian. Right. I mean, that's so ridiculous. In fact, go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Not only did Paul state that he was a carnal Christian, it talks about a whole church being part. What does he say in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1? And look, I'm, I'm never going to be able to Calvinist. There, there's no doctrine that I hate more than Calvinism. Okay? There's no doctrine at all that I hate worse than this. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as, but as unto carnal. And the, the, the Calvinists would say, well, these people aren't saved because they're carnal. Wait a minute. But as unto carnal... Even as unto babes in Christ. Is a baby in Christ saved? It's called a baby Christian. And a baby Christian is a carnal Christian by definition. Right. A baby Christian is a carnal Christian. The church at Corinth was filled with baby Christians. Because they were carnal. That was the proof. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you are not able to bear it. Yet neither yet now are ye able Look, if they weren't saved, Paul would have fed them with the gospel. He wouldn't have fed them with milk. He would have fed them with the gospel. They are saved. They are carnal Christians. They are babes in Christ. Now, I wasn't planning to turn here, so I don't know what the English satanic version says, the ESV, the Calvinist Bible. So maybe they changed this. I don't know. Verse number three, 
For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there's among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So if you're filled with envy and strife and divisions, that means you're carnal. Look, all of us from time to time get envious. All of us from time to time are filled with strife. All of us from time to time are carnal. When Paul the Apostle says that he was a carnal Christian, that's proof that all of us are going to be carnal from time to time. Right. Verse 4, For while one saith, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are ye not carnal? So he makes it very clear here that you can be a carnal Christian. Now, how can anyone read 1 Corinthians 3 and walk away and say there is no such thing as a carnal Christian? When somebody would say that, what they're saying is, I do not believe the Bible. That is what they're actually saying. Because in verse number 1, it makes it very clear that carnal Christian is a babe in Christ. There's no question about it that you can be a carnal Christian and be a believer. And anyone who would be arrogant enough to say that I am never a carnal Christian and I just always desire the things of God, that's ridiculous. The same Calvinists that always desire the things of God are the same Calvinists that always desire the booze on Saturday night. <laughs> Good night, I mean, Martin Luther was famous for just loving beer. Look at the Calvinists. Look at the. None of them will preach against alcohol. None of them. John MacArthur's on there on YouTube and he talks about smoking weed. They have this big council, like all these six different Calvinists. And then Todd Friel, you know, the, the guy with the annoying voice, you know, is taking questions. It's like the Eli Soriano of, of the Calvinist, just the annoying voice. And he's fielding the questions from the audience. And somebody asks a question about smoking weed. And first he says, is this a sin? And every one of the Calvinists says, you know, yes, it's a sin. And they compare it to drinking alcohol. Because basically they're saying, well, what's the difference between alcohol? Because they seem pretty similar. And obviously we don't think alcohol is wrong. And John MacArthur gets up there and he says... You know, smoking weed and drinking wine, drinking alcohol, they're not the same thing at all. He's like, smoking weed inhibits your judgment. He's like, wine doesn't do that at all. <laughs> it's like, I mean, are, are you an idiot? I mean, people think you're so smart. Drinking alcohol does not inhibit your judgment. Well, as long as you only have a little bit. Look, I mean, drinking wine is so much more alcoholic than beer. I mean, it's ridiculous to say. And to say that Jesus turned water into wine in John 2... You've got a bunch of people that supposedly are already being well drunk, which they say is talking about being drunken. And then Jesus adds another cake to the party and just helps them get drunk more. Does that make any sense? Yeah. To say that alcohol doesn't inhibit your judgment at all, why would he say that? Well, because he drinks alcohol. Yeah. And because he's condoning of his own sin. And what you're always going to see with these false religions and people that live their worldly and ungodly lives is what they do is they justify their sin. See, if you have a doctrine that is a saved person, you will never be a carnal Christian, you really got to lower the standards of right and wrong. Basically, where you're good always. So basically, just get rid of everything that's a sin. It's not a sin to listen to rock music. Why? Well, because I listen to rock music sometimes. It's not a sin to get drunk, because why? Well, I mean, I drink from time to time. It's not a sin to do this or that. But they think it's a sin to smoke weed, because they don't smoke weed. Now, these younger batch of Calvinists that are becoming, you know, more liberal, I'm sure they're going to change their standards on smoking weed. But, you know, the older ones, they will never say it's wrong to drink alcohol. I've never heard a Calvinist that thinks it's a sin to drink alcohol. Never one. I'm sure there's one out there, but I've never heard of one. I've heard of the Jeff Durbin. Uh, what is his name? Jeff Durbin. I was, I was thinking dirtbag. That's, that's how I know. <laughs> Jeff Durbin who basically talks about how Guinness was such a godly person who created alcohol and a beer that would make him not as drunk. I've never heard them say it's a sin to drink alcohol. James White doesn't think it's a sin. I mean, good night. What Bible are you reading? Be sober. That's not hard to understand. Right. But I guess it's hard to understand when you are very carnal and you're living a very sinful life. And so Calvinists, they believe at the moment of regeneration you yield your entire life to God. They also say that there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. Paul Washer is famous for saying there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. And it is also impossible to know if you're going to heaven if you're a Calvinist. You say, why is it impossible to know that? Because their evidence for salvation is that you are faithful and endure till the very end. Puritans, which were Calvinists that were basically purified, that's when you get the name Puritan, they were purified in the Anglican Church, which came out of the Catholic Church, came in the Eighth Version. Puritans were famous for being on their deathbed and being scared to death they were going to hell. Isn't it amazing?
amazing that the ones that say, well, I'm one of the chosen, I know, they don't have assurance at the very end. You say, why? Their only assurance is the fact that they've lived a good enough life and they've endured to the end, and it's been known historically. They get to the very end, and they're scared because they're like, and I, I really don't know if I've lived a good enough life. <laughs> but wait a minute. I thought they believed salvation was by grace alone. It yeah. certainly doesn't sound like it. It certainly sounds like at the very end they're scared they're going to hell because they're basing their salvation on their works. Right. Look, Matthew 7 is a great passage, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, that Calvinists ought to look at. Because they're very religious, but quite honestly they're trusting in their works. As much as they say it is by grace alone, they don't actually believe that. Okay? Now, notice what it says in verse number 8. So look, if a person doesn't know if they're going to heaven, can they be saved? No, because if you're saved, you know that you have eternal life. And they cannot know they're going to heaven because their proof is that you persevere on to the very end. You listen to any of the famous Calvinists, and they will admit that it is possible, as strongly as I feel that I'm one of the chosen, that I am deceived. Because it is possible to be a deceived person who's not really saved. So they will admit it is possible when you get them off record, when they're willing to admit the truth, you can hear them say it. Mean, it is possible that I'm, I'm deceived. I just don't believe I'm one of them. But it is possible I'm not one of the elect. They all believe that. None of them really know. Now they will lie through their teeth and they'll lie and say, no, I know I'm one of the elect. But you'll also see other statements where they'll say, it's possible that I'm deceived, but I'm not really one of the elect. Because people can be saved or think they're saved, but it turns out they just turn away from the faith and they were never really saved to begin with. Now, wait a minute. They don't really believe in eternal security. See, we know whether or not we believe on Jesus Christ. We're not trusting in whether or not we persevere unto the end in order to know we're saved. Look, if at the end of my life I commit murder or commit suicide, I'm still on my way to heaven. It's not going to make me question my salvation because I'm not trusting in my perseverance to know whether or not I'm saved. I'm trusting in the fact that when I was 18 years old, Five days before I turned 19, I heard the gospel. I heard that it was eternal life. It was a gift. I could never lose my salvation. I asked Jesus to save me. And I don't have to question my salvation. I don't have to go to my deathbed and hope I'm going to make it and hope I've lived a good enough life. But that is what the Calvinists have always believed and always thought. That's what the Puritans believed. They did not know they were going to heaven because they were trusting in their perseverance. And when they got to the very end, it was manifest that they did not really know they were going to heaven because they were scared. There's so many historical accounts where they were basically scared to death. I'm afraid I'm going to go to hell. And these were the people that were supposedly lived the godliest life. They were the ones that were against like anything. Basically, it's a sin to wear your shoes in a certain place and all this crazy stuff. At the very end of their lives, they were scared to death. They were not going to make it to heaven. And guess what? They didn't make it to heaven because they were trusting in their works. Now, I wish that were the case. I wish that they were saved. But I'm not going to just put a blanket over my head and just say all these people out here are saved. The vast majority of people we talk to will tell us, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. And if they tell us they do know they're going to heaven, most of the times that isn't true either. I wish that weren't the case. Look, you know, people like to think that because we have such a strict standard of getting to heaven, it's because we're so hateful. No, I wish I was wrong about that. I wish everybody who said they were a Christian here in the Philippines was saved. I don't want them to burn in hell. But the reality is, almost all of them are going to burn in hell because they're trusting in their works and they will not get saved unless we preach the gospel to them. There's so many false ways, but Jesus said, I am the way, I'm God. He is the way to get to heaven, not a way, not a son God, the way. Right. Titus 3, verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will not doubt from constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto you. Now, the name of the sermon is Maintaining Good Works in the Midst of False Prophets. Maintaining Good Works in the Midst of False Prophets. We'll get to the false prophets here in a second. But it said in verse 8 that we should be careful to maintain good works. Now, this does not mean, as some people say, that we need to be careful to maintain good works in order to go to heaven. No, we already know we're going to heaven. That's what a lot of false teachers will say. We must be careful to maintain good works or we're not going to make it. No, it says to maintain good works, these things are good and profitable unto men. If you have a dead faith, it's a faith without works and it does not profit men. A faith with works actually profits men. 
But whether or not it's a dead faith or, or an alive faith, which means it's accompanied by works, it's still faith. And so if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you are still saved. Now, in verse number 9, the Bible reads, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. And so the Bible says to avoid foolish questions. Look, there are so many foolish questions that are out there, okay? I've heard this said before. It's kind of funny. You know, it's not really true. But, but there's no such thing as a foolish question. Just foolish people that ask questions. Now, <laughs> it's pretty funny, but honestly, you know, verse 9, I guess we disprove that. Even though I've said that to people before. No such thing as a foolish question. There's foolish people that ask questions. But there are foolish questions. And quite honestly, when people ask a lot of foolish questions, if there are people that go to church... I start questioning whether or not they're an infiltrator. Because this is something I've seen from people that end up being bad people where they ask just stupid questions. They ask really random things that just to try to confuse people. That is a goal. Oftentimes, I have seen that. Somebody that got kicked out of Verity Baptist Church for being a heretic and a devil, he used to ask so many just confusing questions that nobody would ever think about. It's like he just sat at home all day and just looked for some really weird question and would ask it. This is such a foolish question. And he would ask things to try to confuse people. And look, you know, the unsaved person, the atheist, they ask foolish questions. But you don't expect people that are in church to ask foolish questions. Right. Now, I'm not saying that sometimes people might ask something that's a foolish question. But if it's something people are always doing, there's usually something wrong with that person. Now, an obvious foolish question is, can God pick up a rock that is too big, that he, too, too big for him to pick up? What a stupid question it is. Can God create a rock that is too big for himself to, to pick up? And that's, that's so stupid. Okay? Those are the questions the atheists ask. And they think it's, it's smart, but it's like, no, you sound like an idiot. You sound very vocal. It's not a, a smart question. But, you know, quite honestly, you know, sometimes people will ask all these philosophical questions. And when people always ask these philosophical questions, usually there's something wrong with that. Okay? It mentions genealogies. Now, the Mormons are famous for their genealogies. They like to trace back their lineage. It's like they're the white people that say, I wish I was Jewish. And so they try to trace back their lineage. And honestly, they have all these websites for Mormons where they can trace back, you know, far back into the past. Whether or not they have a pure bloodline of Joseph Smith, I guess, I, I don't really know. But the Bible speaks against genealogies. Now, this does not mean it's wrong for you to find out if your grandfather was from, you know, whatever country. You know, when you're from America, you know, your bloodline goes to, like, all kinds of different countries in Europe. You know, you've got ancestors from Sweden, Yugoslavia, Germany, England, France, just name the country. You know, you have to tracing back that, like that. But, you know, when people use genealogies to make themselves better than other people, like the Jews, for example, they look to, like to trace their genealogies and say, I can trace myself back to Abraham. Well, first off, no, you can't. You're making a lot of guesses in and when you're talking over 5,000 years, I promise you there's adultery that was committed and where somebody thought this was a child and it really wasn't. So you really can't trace back that far. But, you know, what is your purpose to do that? What difference does it make whether or not your bloodline goes all the way back to Abraham or not? Because it wasn't a, a, a physical thing being passed down from Abraham. It was a spiritual thing, as the Bible says in the book of Galatians. Do you believe on Jesus Christ? And the Bible says to avoid foolish questions and genealogies and Tensions and strivings about the law. Basically, don't fight about stupid things. Right. Now, I think it's great if we talk about the Bible. You know, we were before the service, me, Brother Herman, Brother Dustin, we were talking about the book of Jude and, and, and you know, Cain and Korah and, um, you know, the analogies we can use with Balaam and all those of the false prophets and different types of reprobates. It's great to talk about the Bible and have profitable conversations. It's not profitable to talk about stupid stuff. And that is what the Bible is speaking about here. So it's not wrong to talk about the Bible. Obviously, that's great. But when you just mix in all these foolish questions, that's when it becomes ridiculous. Right. Now, it says in verse number 10, a man that is inherited after the first and second admonition reject. Now, in the earlier Catholic versions, I, I, I suppose what it said was, a man that is inherited after the first and second admonition kill. Because that's <laughs> just what they did for a long period of time. The Catholic Church says, hey, you know what? If, if they will not repent of their heresy, they won't change their mind about what they believe, just kill them. I mean, they would kill them for so many stupid things. They'd kill them for what they believed was the center of the earth. 
They used to kill you for what you believe, but you thought the earth was the center of the universe. It's like, kill him. He's a heretic. I mean, for just anything that you believe. And it's like, look, if people disagree with you on things, you don't just kill them. The Bible says to reject them if they're a heretic, but you don't kill them. Look, when we go out soul winning, a lot of people reject what we have to say. If we went around just killing everybody and just to make it a, a pure, you know, like independent, fundamental Baptist world, you know, that's ridiculous. The Bible says that the person who's a heretic, you reject, okay? You don't kill that person. Now, what it means, though, by them being a heretic is basically when you're showing them something in the Bible and they're just rejecting it completely. Right. When you're showing somebody something in the Bible, like in Revelation 21.8, all liars shall have their part, and they say, you know, I'm not sure about that. They're not rejecting the word of God if they're not sure. People can hear the gospel and not get saved, and they're not rejecting the gospel. There is a difference between rejecting the gospel, believing the gospel. There's an in-between position where you're just not sure. The Bible speaks about people with parable of the sower that just, they didn't understand. They heard the gospel, and it just didn't click with them. As much as is possible, we try to make the gospel plain and simple and understandable, but there will still be people that just don't get it. It doesn't quite click with them. That doesn't make them a heretic. See, a heretic is when somebody's basically made a choice to reject what the Bible says. They clearly see, okay, all liars shall have a problem. I don't believe that. I don't believe that one lie would send you to hell. Just don't believe it. That's someone who's rejecting the word of God. That's one application. You show them James 2.10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and get offended in one point, he is guilty of all. And they say, I don't believe that. I do not believe that a loving God would send somebody to hell just because they stole something or just because they did something wrong. That is someone who's rejecting what the Bible says. Okay? They're, they're basically showing their inheritance. So what do we do? We basically just reject them and move on to the next person. If you are in the middle of preaching the gospel to someone and you realize this person is rejecting the word of God and they will not get saved, you move on to the next person. Okay. Look, people that have gone solely with me have seen me just be in the middle of a conversation and the person just not believing it. And how do I end the conversation? Well, hey, we'd love to have you come to church sometime. You know, we have our address right there on the front, on the back, and you know, it explains the gospel a little bit more thoroughly. Now, I'm still friendly to them. I'm not a jerk to them. But I realize if I spend another 20 minutes, I'm not going to get them saved. And they're already proving they reject the Word of God. Maybe one day they will be receptive to the Word of God, but not right now. And many people we talk to, it doesn't matter if the Lord Jesus Christ was preaching the gospel to them. It doesn't matter if Paul the Apostle was preaching the gospel. They're just not going to get saved. They're just choosing to reject the word of God. They're choosing to be, you know, a heretic or not believe the word of God. And so we just reject them. We just move on to the next person. Okay? And so it says here in verse number 11, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. What does subverted mean? Well, look at the first three letters of subverted. Subverted, you see S-U-B, sub. Think of a submarine. What does a submarine do? It goes underneath the water. Okay? When we're talking about subverted, we're basically talking about somebody who goes and tries to take down authority. They basically go underneath and try to overcome and topple authority. Okay? Someone trying to intentionally just destroy it or knock it down. Someone who is subverted is trying, someone who's trying to topple authority. Now, if it's somebody out soloing, it's not a big deal. We just move to the next person. But if it's somebody in the church who's basically here, whether or not they claim to be saved or not is, is really just doesn't matter. Because if they're trying to subvert the church, they need to just hit the road and get out. Right. If they're trying to topple the authority and just change everything about the church, it's like, you know, I'm sorry, but our church is united. We know what we believe. We're united on, on what we do, what we believe, on so many and things such as this. And if somebody tries to come in and just over topple the authority of the church, just change everything we do, it's kind of like, you know what, you need to just kind of hit the road and go to the Bible Baptist Church next week. Okay, because we're not used to having to do it. Right. Now, this does not happen that often. But, you know, if there is a situation where somebody needs, needs to be kicked out of church, they just get kicked out of church. Now, I remember very someone who got kicked out of church, you know, kind of the last straw was we were having a soul in meeting where we're pairing people up and sending them out. And when I'm doing that, he's just criticizing me, and I work for the church. And Pastor Jimenez wasn't there, but he's basically criticizing the authority. And he basically, he, he literally said, you know, I think it's really stupid to go out that far for so 
And he's like, you know, we, we've already knocked these doors plenty of times. And it's like he's in front of like 15 other church people, and he's just like criticizing. And he's upset with me, got paired with and everything. It's like, dude, what is your problem? You know, you don't want to go soul winning. Then, and I told him, I said, hey, if you don't want to go soul winning, then just, you know, go do whatever you want. It doesn't matter to me. But I was like, you know, if you've got a problem, you can do your soul winning wherever you want if you don't like the map. You just go out 30 minutes, like you said, and go soul winning to an area that's never been hit. Just drive 45 minutes and knock your doors if that's what you want to do. But when people are trying to topple authority, it's a big red flag. Think about Korah. What, what is the situation with Korah that takes place? Everybody's holy in this church. They're basically trying to overtop, you know, basically take down the authority. That is a big red flag and oftentimes reprobates are like that. Now go back to Titus 1. Titus 1. Now, I, I don't want to give you the wrong impression because I started off this sermon talking about how basically we should obey the government and be gentle, not to speak badly about people, things such as that, and here just reject someone who's you know a false prophet or whatever. But that doesn't change the fact that in Titus 1 verse 11, it says whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy Luther's sake. And the Bible says who subvert whole houses. So this is the same word, subverted. And see, the problem is that if somebody's in a church and they aren't dealt with, they can start to subvert whole houses and end up messing up everybody. And basically try to change doctrine and confuse people. So there is a time you've got to stop their mouths and rebuke it. But you know, usually you just try to be gentle and not have to do that. But there is a time where you do have to stop that. Now turn to Titus 3. Titus 3. And what the key was in Titus 1 was it says teaching things which they ought not. You say, what is something that people should not be teaching? Well, basically anything that the church is against. I mean, if you're at the church and the church teaches, hey, grace by uh, salvation by grace through faith, and you're teaching something else, it's like, well, what are some of the church that you agree with? Right. But even on more minor doctrines, look, if it's something the church stands for and believes, people are welcome to believe what they want, but you don't want to create this atmosphere where people are saying, well, I disagree with the pastor on this, I disagree with Brother Stucky on this. It's like, yeah, we all have various different opinions, but, you know, it's not your place to try to subvert the church and change things. Now, I'm all for if somebody comes up to me and says, Hey, Brother Stucky, I have a different thought on this verse. Here's my opinion. And quite honestly, I can say something I might be wrong sometimes. You know, I do make mistakes, okay? I, I, I even mentioned it in, in the sermon on Sunday, somebody mentioned from YouTube. You know, I, I misspoke in something I said from Acts chapter 2. And look, I do make mistakes, and that's why I encourage people to basically listen to, to the sermons and decide for themselves what they believe. And don't just take everything at face value, because I admit I'm just a man. And so it's okay, you know, to, to disagree with something and to come to me and tell me. But what's not okay is to go around and just tell everybody, hey, brother, stuff is wrong about this and this and this. Then you're starting to cause problems in the church. And if there is no authority at a church, everything is going to crumble. It's not this free-for-all method in the Bible. The Bible teaches about pastor-run churches. I understand I'm not the pastor, but I am the one who's in charge here put by a pastor in Now, in Titus 3, verse 12, the Bible reads... When I shall send Artemis on to thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Now, what you see here in verse 12 is that Paul is basically sending people. And this is a common pattern that Paul has, where he's often sending people to do various missions and to do various things. One of the reasons why he does this is he's sending people to report on the great works that are being done. And he wants things to be organized and in order. Now, in today's world, it's very easy to report on what's going on. You can put a YouTube update video very easily. You can put a Facebook update very easily. But in that day, they obviously could not do that. And in verse number 11, it says, Bring Zenus to the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting on them. Now, verse 13 is a key verse. What you're saying is you should always have a lawyer with you. Okay? <laughs> Bring Zenus to the lawyer. You say, why should you always have a lawyer? Well, quite honestly, if you're living for God and preaching the truth, you've got a good chance of being soon. Now, I'm obviously half-joking, but quite honestly, you know, there, there is a lawyer that goes to very Baptist church, very godly person. And quite honestly, he was very helpful during the protest. <laughs> he, was, he was able to write various letters and stuff that really was able to help us out, you know. So according to verse 13, you should always have a lawyer with you, which is why we've been trying to recruit lawyers to come to our church, okay? <laughs> Reach out to all people. Verse number 14, 
And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. All that are with me salute thee, greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Now, this is a pretty short book, but quite honestly, I think Titus is a, is a pretty powerful verse. book. Verse by verse, chapter by chapter, there's a lot of great information.